Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 54, An Awful Lot of Trouble. Thank you for putting up with my absence last week. I unfortunately had to go to a funeral last week, and it just kind of made things a little difficult as far as recording goes. Uh, I'm back at it now, and uh, we're in the heat of things, as they say. So let's get started, shall we? Offa, the King of Mercia, became king in 757 AD and was probably the most powerful man in what would be the island of Britain. His power held sway effectively from the south of the River Humber all the way to the ocean to the south, to the English Channel to the east, and in our situation and in our consideration, to the west and into Wales. His dominance is such that he actually overshadows much of what might have happened in Wales at that point in time. In fact, if we look at the Welsh Annals, they are almost nothing there during this period, and a lot of the records that we have come from other sources about Offa. Offa wasn't well written about, wasn't very well known, he wasn't a king of Wessex, so Alfred's uh, chroniclers and writers didn't uh, really stress him very much. And he was powerful enough, though, that he was influential both within his own nation and internationally. He had developed relationships with Charles the Great of France, with the Pope, influential enough that he actually moved uh an archbishopric into his local vicinity, and he had such influence over Wales that he created a monument which still stands to this day, which acts as kind of a border line between what we know now as Wales and what we knew is now England, and much of this comes about during his lifetime. In fact, the dike that he builds, which isn't as big as Asser puts it, because Asser calls it sea to sea, um, one of his seas, of course, being a river. But nonetheless, it's, it's an impressive object, and it took a lot of effort. And in some cases, he went so far as to uh, enlist monks and help building it, which you can imagine how fond they were of that idea. He becomes one of the first of his Anglo-Saxon people to be named uh, the king of, or the fatherland of the English, which was awarded to him in one of his charters, and proclaims how big he appeared, at least to later genealogies. And when we talk about Office Dyke, the structure that we have today stretches more than 64 miles, or 103 kilometers, northwards from the River Wye, near Hereford, to the vicinity of Mould and Cloyd. The northern end of the Great Dyke is backed up by a 49-mile, 62-kilometer Watts Dyke, which overlaps and continues on to the estuary of the River Dee, one of Asser's seas, obviously. Um, the problem is we don't fully understand how it was built or where... It, well, we how it was built, I think, is pretty obvious, but the where it was built and when it was built is a little bit less obvious. It's it's not it's not a structure that goes from one end of what we now call Wales to the other on the eastern side. It is not an official border, but it is important enough that it stands out. It's important enough that even today we find it in the structures of the countryside, and it was important enough that it created some sort of border. There is a theory that runs that it actually was between Mercia and Powys, and was something of a trade barrier wherein the Mercians could control who went back and forth, be it merchants, uh, be it travelers, be it even just family members. Because, of course, we have to remember that at this period of time, there is not a separation really between the Welsh in Wales and the Welsh in Mercia, or even, for that matter, the Saxons in, that existed in Wales, which there were some of, and the Saxons that existed in Mercia. So, largely, these two groups intermingled. So, this border was a little different than what we think of. It wasn't to keep the Welsh out, or the English in, or vice versa. It was about, I think, funneling 
trade and military movement so that they could control it better. Particularly if Powis was, as we saw in our last episode, a bit of a pain in the side of the Mercians and the fact that it continued to kind of appear, rise up, have to be put down by the by the kings of Mercia and then come back and once again rise up and, and go through this whole process. In fact, for a number of years, Powis almost ceases to exist, at least on two occasions, and comes back into existence to the point where they put up a monument dedicating it to the first version and the second. So we have evidence that this happened, and we have evidence it happened during the time of Offa, because the rise of Powis the first time comes in the midst of the 8th century, in the middle of this uprising and rise of Offa to power. And Offa as a king had influence in, not only in England and Wales, but in actual fact was always continually trying to expand his reach to other peoples. And he tried to make treaties and to try and marry children off to, to the kings in Europe. Now, how the kings of Europe perceived him is... Uh, topic for another show uh, not my show obviously and and going in depth into Offa is not really the point of this particular episode but rather to talk about the fact that he was very very influential his coinage is some of the earliest return of coinage to Britain at this point in time after the Romans left his slow merger of Mercia from being something of a ruler kingdom over a bunch of sub-kingdoms to becoming Greater Mercia to becoming Mercia, where all of these sub-kingdoms just start to cease to exist. The Huissa, for example, and we might even say Powis at times, ceases to exist under the Mercian dominance and probably is subsumed at least at points in Mercia. And we know, at least from the Welsh annals, that there were battles between Offa and Gwyneth and so the northern Welsh kingdoms were in constant conflict, constant negotiations, constant disagreement with Offa, with the Mercians, who at the same time have tremendous influence in Kent and in the West Saxons and, of course, in the Cornish areas. And he continues to proceed in part to expand this dominance. Now, the other reason why Offa is so important is not only did he do all this, but he had a very long reign in which to do all this, which creates problems for other kings if they're dying at a fairly normal pace, because Offa was around for almost 50 years. So his dominance from being a young man ruling a country which was just gaining power to being an old man who's looking to continue the lineage beyond himself. This is a guy who had had time and effort and opportunity to expand and control quite a grand, uh, large portion of territory. And so we talk about him simply because of the influence he had and how this influence expanded. From a Welsh perspective, of course, he was a, a formidable enemy. And in some ways, probably the interruptions that he created were destabilizing. You would think that, at least for Powis, it would be incredibly destabilizing to lose the leadership of your country on a couple of occasions and to have yourself having to rebuild after an attack by the Mercy. And same could be said of Gwyneth, who lost one of their kings. And if it's to be believed, the last king of Altcloid, Dumnigal, the third was killed in 760 in Hereford. So if that's the case, uh, then he's not just affecting southern kingdoms, he's also affecting even up to Scotland and the northern kingdoms. And it wasn't very long after this started to occur that you had effectively this end of any sort of sense that much of Mercia could be stopped. And from effectively 760 to at least into the 9th century, they had dominance in the area and they were influencing things well beyond where they were. And when uh, Offa died in 796, even then there were still Welsh kings that were dying. 
including uh, the king of Doifed, uh, Merduth, who died at the Battle of Rutlan. So his influence is wide, vast, and broad. And of course, he brings with him legal documentation. He brings with him a rise of the Christian church in the East and the West. And he creates more conflict for the Welsh in trying to deal with them. And I think in a way, this starts to force the Welsh kingdoms to deal with them in ways that I don't think they expected. For example, by 768, the Welsh kingdoms finally accept the dating of Easter as the Romans have kept it. For all of these years, going back to the Roman period, they had held that the dating of Easter was different, the separation, as we talked about under Bede, of all of these arguments over how a tonsor should be worn, starts to end at this period of time, and, and even Gwyneth comes under the same concepts and the same ideas, thus creating less separation even amongst the church and that brings a lot of change for the christian community because now no longer are you fighting a heretic when you fight your saxon opposition or your welsh opposition if you're saxon but you're actually fighting a fellow christian and that means something to a degree at this point and at least as far as the pope's concerned at least as far as the monks are concerned that argument suddenly becomes a lot less important. And the other thing we kind of see out of this is a more nationalistic rise. And we're going to see this, especially in Wales, over the coming next hundred years, as we start to see a major change in who the kings are at this point. One of the biggest problems comes at the end of the 8th century, when one of the last uh, of the old line of Gwyneth kings is killed, and his sons will eventually have to deal with the consequences of this, which in the long run will bring a change that will have an effect right up until the end of the Welsh kingdoms as independent bodies. So we have a very large change in the way Wales works, in the way Wales influences others, and in how it can separate itself from its English neighbors. And Mercia is creating a difficult situation. You can imagine having such a big, influential country near you has massive effects on you. I mean, we'll see it again when England becomes a united country and they put an end to Dane law, and then eventually, of course, the Normans take over, that England now suddenly becomes the elephant in the room for Wales, where it, they just can't get away from it, and the, the Welsh lack of unity becomes a problem. And even when they are unified, they're still backbiting, they're still fighting, there's still arguments that'll go on, which will create more and more conflict between all these groups. And Powys and Gwyneth will be at the head of most of these arguments. So those two kingdoms, as powerful as they are, continue to create problems for themselves and the English going forward. And we'll see some of this as it grows and how it changes and develops. And in a way, that's one of the biggest things that we start to see in this era, is that the results of Offa and his influence aren't just in the fact that he creates this massive defensive barrier or sets an artificial border which lives beyond his life, even to this day, as an image of the separation between the Saxons and the Welsh, or the English and the Britons, or the Cymry, as they're now calling themselves. And so this whole feeling of change, of division between these groups, has come not just about being an interloper and this the native population. Now it comes down to the fact of whose kingdom has influence and can influence others. And largely, that comes down to Offa because of his power base. In fact, if we look at the Mercian power base, it stretches right across the entire country. And in part, even Welsh kingdoms that were independent or semi-independent had overlordship given by Offa and his influence in that respect by Offa. And it sets a pattern wherein English kingdoms from here on out, 
will try and seek to dominate the Welsh kingdoms and try and gain various types of overlordship at various levels over the Welsh, over the Welsh kingdoms. And that influence is unstoppable from this point. From this point on, there is none of this, you know, the Welsh as a equal or higher partner in all of these discussions. From here on out, the Welsh kingdoms are subservient whenever they work with the English. It's because they're in a subservient role for some reason. And at the same time as all this is happening, of course, we have the beginnings of the Viking landings in Ireland, in Scotland, in Lindisfarne, in England. And all of this starts to change again, kind of what it means to be British, what it means to be Welsh, what it means to be Anglish or English, and what the separation is amongst these groups. And in some respects, the Welsh will become dependent upon the invaders to try and help them defeat the Saxons. And in a large part, that's part of the problem that Wales runs into from here on out, is that the invading forces generally seem to adapt the same concepts and ideas that the Saxons had about the Welsh, in that they are the subservient kingdoms and not to be in any way dominant. And this really should be understood when we look at these things and how we see the ending of any sort of intimation of what the Welsh can do as, as kingdoms and how influential they are to the overall story. It doesn't mean that they aren't important or that they aren't critical later on. They certainly will be, and their influence will be felt, but it'll be felt as additional people. Uh, the debates over how Alfred gathers forces from the Welsh, influences the Welsh kingdoms, how the Vikings try and use Welsh kingdoms against the English, how eventually the Norman marcher lords will start to dominate east and south of Wales, and how all of this will eventually lead to the end of Welsh independence as separate kingdoms. Because at the end of the day, the one thing that the Welsh couldn't really do solidly was unify beyond one king. Much like Offa unified the southern English, his own overlordship ended at his death. His heirs do not carry forward in any way, shape, and form the same sort of hegemony that he had. The dominance of Mercia comes to an end not long after his death. And... It really won't be until Alfred and the West Saxons arrive to the scene properly that we have a change in that dominance to where the next king is the son of the previous one and the next one and the next one and the next one. And that this dominance comes to a point where there's only one real king of England. In Wales, we never really get there. It always is just about on the cusp but it never really happens. We never really have a unity of the Welsh kingdoms. We always really do have a short-lived unity, which then falls apart because of various reasons, be it betrayal, be it jealousy, be it the death of the influential and charismatic or dominant king and his heirs not being able to live up to it, or Conversely, of course, the change in inheritance and how that influenced the overall scheme of things. One thing we're going to talk about going forward is we are going to talk about the Welsh military and how they were used in this period and going forward. And as we get closer to the arrival of the Normans, how that influenced how the Welsh fought battles, how it influenced their ability to resist the Normans when they arrive to a certain degree and maintain their independence against constant invasion and uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating subject it's a fascinating thing to look at and the Saxons influence at this point becomes I wouldn't say overwhelming that's the wrong word but I think there it's without a doubt that they have control of this situation and off his influence of course being a huge one and he kind of sets the pattern for all the rest and I guess that's what I'm saying in this episode largely is that the pattern for English dominance over Wales is actually set by Offa. And his 
ways of dealing with Welsh incursion. Obviously, the Office Dyke, one of the big developments of it, it's not just a military defensive point. It's also one of stopping raids, of stopping, of using military and civilians to keep control over certain things. Like I said, trade, shipment of goods, shipment of people, the movement back and forth of slaves, because we still have some of this going on. Um, and the control of the Welsh. And certainly this sets that artificial separation to that point. And yes, it may have just been Powys, but it won't be long before people just consider that to be the start of the border. And the border just goes all of this distance. And it's in the mind of people to the point where Asser talks about it as just a, a total division point. And that's only, a, you know, a hundred years later. And in a few hundred years after that, it's just, that is the border. That is Wales, this is England, and they're not the same thing. And so what Offa did was he separated for time and eternity what we consider to be the Welsh side of the line and what we consider to be the English side of the line. And make no mistake, that was part of it. It was partially a mental thing. And no doubt both sides considered it that way. So, and wrote about it that way. Because, I mean, we have it in both detailed opinions of how this separated them, how this set them apart. Even as I said earlier, there were Saxons on one side and, Brit and Welsh on the other side. And they flip back and forth depending on which side you're talking about. And yet, somehow, this said, you're Welsh, you're English, and there's the division. And so that's something to think about going forward as we talk about Welsh history, because, of course, this is an important portion of Welsh history. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for allowing me to have some time to sort of sort myself out. And uh, we're right back at it, and we'll be back next week. Until then, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewelry, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.